the conditions for existence on Earth are sustained by a complex web of climatic processes. Annual rains, predictable seasons and consistent temperatures all allow life to flourish. But our over-reliance on fossil fuels is causing the delicate balance of our planet to shift. Instances of extreme weather used to be rare, but now deadly heat waves, wildfires, powerful floods, hurricanes and droughts are becoming the norm. The question is no longer will they happen, but when and how we can cope with them. I'm Doni Kanile in Kenya to explore a high-tech solution that is helping herders survive ongoing drought. And I'm Russell Beard in Myanmar, where drones are helping to protect coastal communities against extreme weather events. For two years, Kenya has been in the grip of a devastating drought. Amongst those worst affected are Kenya's over 5 million pastoralists, for whom finding fresh water and lush pastulans is critical for the survival of their herds. But something has been developed. Could something like this hold the key to getting herders around the country through these difficult times? Today, an app called AfriScout is being launched in the town of Kajiado. There'll be herders from all over the region who've come to learn more about the app and take that information back to their villages. I'm interested to see what they make of the new technology. AfriScout is the brainchild of Project Concern International, or PCI, an NGO committed to helping herders cope with drought. Nearly 4,000 people around Africa use it so far, and today it's being officially rolled out in Kenya. Thank you very much for coming. Really appreciate your presence here. Thank you for coming to support. PCI hopes to revolutionize how herders find water by using something 87% of Kenyans already have in their pockets, a smartphone. So what is AfriScout? Who here has AfriScout on their phones? The app accesses satellite maps which detail the water conditions throughout Kenya, updating every 10 days. This is Pajiado, what you're looking at right now. This is the current vegetative condition. You can also zoom to find surface water. So as you can see here, this is a, a pond that has not yet dried up, right? Using it, herders can see the instantly where to target migration and avoid using drier areas which need time to recuperate. <laughs> to find out more about how the app can help herders, I'm off to southern Kenya where some Maasai have lost over half their cattle. Joshua Ndaserua has been using AfriScout for three months. Joshua. Yes. Hi, I'm Doni. Okay. Thank you so much for yeah. allowing us to come to your home and join you today. Yeah. These are your animals? Yeah, these are my animals. Okay. Uh, he's my father. Pleasure to meet you, Saba. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's my brother. Hello. Hello, yeah. nice to meet you. Yeah. He's another brother of mine. Hello. These are my, these are my young boys. It's a pleasure yeah. to meet you all. I, yeah. So we're going to get started? Are we going to walk now? Uh, there is a milking process. Milking the cows? And yeah. And okay. Then, yeah, after milking, we will go. Here's my mom. Hello. Yeah, Hello. I'm milking now. Yeah. Maybe the cow will be a bit wild when... A bit wild? Yeah, when you go near to it. So Does that mean it can possibly just, kick? Uh -huh. For the Maasai, cattle are highly prized. A large cow can fetch as much as $500 at market, but it's even more valuable as a source of food for the family. Something that seems so simple, but it's really not as easy as it looks. You need to have quite a good rhythm yeah. and enough strength to make it come yeah. out properly. Yeah. And when you take this milk, it is very sweet, it's very nice. So when you have a drought like Kenya is having now, mm -hmm. how does that affect your cattle? Last drought, when I migrated near to Tanzania, I lost uh, uh, roughly 15 big 15 cows. cows. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It has a big impact. 
because I felt it, it is very bad, but when it comes to a situation that I cannot control it, I have to bear. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I know today we're going to take a trek, and I'm, I'm hoping that you can show me the, the tool that you've been using now that makes it easier. You just, you just download the apps, and then you, you will see where there is green pastures. Like right now, when you see, this is the place that we are. This is Imaroro. Oh, this is where we are, Imaroro. Yeah. Okay. And you can see now uh, the, 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 the situation here is really becoming dry. Mm. But when you, you push it this way, near to Ormond, you can see there is a green pastures here. Okay, so yeah. that is the journey that we will be making. Yeah. We, we, we walk about uh, 44 kilometers. 44 kilometers? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's a long way to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, come. Let's yeah. go. Okay. It's a long trek. <laughs> Maasai, like Joshua, are accustomed to walking as far as it takes to find good pasture, staying away from their families for months at a time. Migration is very difficult, but uh, we have to because you cannot uh, just stay because they will die. Joshua didn't have the app last year when the conditions were also extreme. This is one of the cow that I, I lost. When I was moving this one, he fell down here. We, we tried to help it, but no, it eventually it died. That's incredibly sad. Yeah. So you had gone to try and look for water and, and pastures for the cows, but the cow just couldn't make the journey. Yeah. And the cow just collapsed here. Yeah, it, it was a big cow. It also a big uh, five, six liters of milk daily uh, in the morning, six liters in the evening. Mm. So it was a real loss for you. Yeah, it is a loss. Yeah. It just, it brings back home just the thought that it's such a difficult way of life because you have to keep on the move to find the water and to find the grazing lands. But in order to move, these animals use so much energy to go from one place to another. So if you don't know where you're going, and you're just trying your luck wherever you can, it's incredibly hard for these animals. Yeah. Yeah, it's a huge difference. Yeah. With almost 30% of his livestock already lost to drought, it's even more pressing for Joshua to keep his surviving cattle in good condition, which means finding ample water during the trek. Now we are going to the uh, uh, drinking point. There is a silanka somewhere here and we needed the cow to take water there. According to the app, it's 30 kilometers from where they started. This is a really popular place to come and drink. I see someone else has brought their cows. Yeah. Can we find a place under the tree, maybe have a bit of a rest? Yeah. I'm quite tired. <laughs> <laughs> so can we see this watering hole on the map? This is Imaroro. We came from this place. We are traveling. Mm -hmm. So now we are just somewhere here. You can see some somewhere here. Knowing the location of a temporary water source like this could mean life or death for a herd. Um, but the app can make all this much simpler. Are you teaching them how to use yeah, the app? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because yeah. at the moment when you need to look for water for your cattle or for pastures, what do you do? You mm. just go blindly. Yes. So you think you might use it? Yeah. And does it sound interesting? Does it sound Good. like something you would use? Excellent. Uh -huh. wow. It's been 10 hours and we're into what should be good pasture land. This is a place that we were in the morning in yeah. Maruro, and we have travel all the way from Mimaroro to Ormundus. Okay, we yeah. made it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not so bad, eh? Maybe yeah. I'm an honorary Maasai, maybe. Yeah, maybe. yeah. <laughs> yeah maybe. But you can see the difference. It's so much better here, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so much better. This place is becoming more better. So the cows will be able to stay here. They'll have enough food to eat. Yeah, they will stay here for almost one month. Mm. And then after there, we shall 
see again the map where they shall be green grass and then we shall move. I've had a wonderful day. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm tired. <laughs> but I've had a wonderful day. Sorry. And I must thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now we can move to the homestead because now the sun is setting. Then we shall have a cup of tea. And then we leave us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could use one. Yeah. <laughs> For the herders with access to satellite maps, livestock mortality has nearly halved. Since Joshua has relied on AfriScout, he hasn't lost any cows to drought. For him, the app has been a real success. Extreme weather events are now a regular occurrence around the world. Scientists have found that human-caused climate change is at the root of over two-thirds of them. The result is often human suffering. In 2017, hundreds were left dead and many thousands homeless by unusual weather conditions. The hurricane season in the Caribbean caused unprecedented levels of destruction. Devastating floods swept across Southeast Asia. Tornadoes hit the south of the US and California was roasted by a heat wave. Since 2009, one person every second has been displaced by disaster. It's predicted that by 2050, there'll be 200 million environmental migrants. What we currently observe is that people migrate temporarily and over short distance internally within their countries. If there's a drought or an environmental stress, you move, you temporarily move, but then there's sort of the expectation and an incentive and the reality that people come back. What we might see in the future is permanent migration and longer distance migration. We might see whole communities having to relocate because their livelihoods are no longer uh, sustainable. It might be entire nation states that have to move. Mangroves are among the most biodiverse habitats on the planet. And they play a vital role in the lives of coastal communities. But these forests are facing deforestation. 35% of the world's mangroves have already been lost. And here in the Irrawaddy Delta, only 16% of original cover is left. I'm in Myanmar, where a local innovative project is combining grassroots conservation with state-of-the-art drone technology to take mangrove regeneration to new heights. Myanmar is vulnerable to cyclones, which strike every few years. In 2008, the worst ever, Cyclone Nargis, claimed more than 130,000 lives. Experts now believe that mangroves hold the key to saving thousands of lives when the next big storm hits. find out how, I've come to meet a local coconut farmer who agreed to show me his mangrove forest. Oh wow, these are proper trees. The tallest mangroves here reach 25 meters and a sturdy 40 centimeters in diameter. The forest was planted after a cyclone in 1975. These trees here, did you plant them? You can imagine these incredibly violent storms that blow in here and you start to understand how these mature forests actually have the capacity to break that, that wind and, and uh, stop some of that storm surge making its way into these settlements and farms. And how about maybe some of the other farms where there's no mangroves. Do you know of any uh, farms that um, suffer because of the storms? Yeah. 
，好嘛，嗯，咪死人遐哩，无你落阿家咪死人遐哩，你咪死人遐，未咪死人哩哦，阿哩落，嗯，来得头，来得就变嘞。So it's a a, a protection, it... yeah.、Uh. So if mangroves are so effective at protecting against storms, why have one million hectares been cut down since 1978, leaving the population here unprotected? I'm meeting Wing Nyong, an ecologist with 30 years experience in forestry, to find out more. Yeah. Wing, hello. How are you? Thanks for meeting yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you to meet you. Yeah, Thanks so much. Wynn heads the Worldview International Foundation's Mangrove Regeneration Project here in Myanmar. 25 years ago, when I, I came to here to collect the mangrove seed, so at that time, we cannot see the small here. We cannot see, we cannot see. Because uh, here, it's a very big mangrove tree that cover from this uh, river bed. Yeah. Now, within the 25 years, Almost of the mangrove trees are already gone. Wow. At the moment, this mangrove, all of this mangrove condition is severely degraded. Right. In the coastal area, 60% of the villagers, they don't have the permanent job. They try to find out the money from there mangrove area. Mm -hmm. And then they can come and cut the tree. Within the one hour, they can get the money for their livelihood. No, I understand. Yeah. So you're talking about really a negative feedback yeah. cycle. Yeah. It's yeah. this confluence of the environmental mm. uh, stresses and yeah. the economic stresses and yeah. it's driving people into the mangroves. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I understand. Shrimp and rice farming, as well as charcoal production, have stripped Myanmar of mangroves leaving it critically exposed. If action isn't taken soon, the communities who live here are in danger of being decimated by the next big storm. There are still trees here. Yeah, yeah, there's trees. This is so, uh, the existing tree. Okay. Uh, this is uh, our planted trees. Okay. Two, from there, 2015. Wynn and a hundred locals have systematically planted 400,000 seedlings by hand here in the last three years. Yeah, it goes right the back, yeah, all the yeah. way through, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. But the job is far from complete. Okay, so we've come right into the thick of it here. All that work that we can hear in the background, that's a lot of chopping and preparing of the ground before 300,000 seedlings or more are going to go into this mud. So it sounds like there's a lot of hard work going on, so we should maybe go and try and lend a hand. <laughs> Hi, I'm Russell. Hi. So, uh, can you tell me, uh, are you are you from this area? You know what? Oh, I say don't allow what oh. Oh, the little mat little little ni. We do live in the Baba Po there, but that one is no buying so. Little dia makano, makano ada di hero same hero so. Do you feel some way you are uh, giving something back? You know what, Lou Zagar, I don't know. Maybe I take my Lou Zagar, you know what? The Dory Cold Wallace, the Yavi Ura, the Lou People's or the Namle, who was even. A good yard of my baby, the 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 baby, <laughs> yeah, I understand. Can you show me how to do it? I'm, I am a complete novice. But just... Backhand. I'm getting, it, getting the hang of it, I feel it. It's all about the angles. Yeah, OK. Yeah, just like that. The team have 35,000 hectares of coastline to plant. And they're racing to do it before the next big cyclone hits. This is an incredibly complex mm. ecosystem that we're looking at here. And no. as an ecologist, it must be 
incredibly challenging to move towards restoration. But when this turned to the latest technology... So, uh, from this area, uh, we're trying to uh, make the, the planting and the drone. And are they, are they working today, the, the, the uh, drone Yes, uh, they are they're working today, yeah. Today, the Oxford-based team of scientists will be testing whether their double-propeller quadro-copter drone can fire 7,000 seeds in an hour. It's so cutting-edge, I've been asked to stand back. Arena Fedorenko heads up the project. So, um, has this ever been done before, anything like this, to your knowledge? Uh, of, no, to, to our knowledge, we are definitely the first one, and uh, it's going to be our largest uh, experiment. Um, is there any chance we could have a look at one of the pods, just to kind of get sure. a sense of what, you're, what we're actually dealing mm. with here? So, what is, what, what is inside this? They're made from biodegradable plastic uh, mm -hmm. and all natural material, and inside you also, well, you have local seeds, and you have uh, local minerals and natural material. It looks like we're nearly there. I just saw a green light. Good, you good, good. We're happy. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. All good? Auto. The test will be successful if, once shot into the ground, all pods embed in the soil deep enough for growth to occur. If it works, the team will return in a few months' time to plant 24 million more. That is... I have never seen anything like that before, yeah. The drone has a pre-programmed flight path. If the seeds penetrate the soil, the chance of each of these pods becoming a tree is greater than if planted by nature or hand, because the depth will make them more resistant to erosion. Touchdown, and the team are happy. The seeds are in the ground, and it's time for nature to take its course. I was just thinking that inside this thing, I mean, it's, there's so much more than just seeds. It's, it's the future. It's a potential to save life because mangroves, it's the living shield. They protect people from the ocean. They protect people from tsunami, from hurricanes. And we have to do it now and we have to do it at a massive scale because from today to maybe six months from now, maybe one year from now as maximum, we will have a growing shield already. So if the cyclone hits next year, uh, people here would be protected. And when you, when you put it like that, you know, all of a sudden, something so small can seem very significant indeed. So I'm actually going to put that back in the ground where we found it. Well, okay. good luck, little one. I'll stick you right in there. The scientist's test is finished. <laughs> Thank you. But for Wynn and his team, it's just the beginning. They'll monitor the seed's progress carefully if all goes to plan, many more trees will be planted by drone here in the near future, helping to safeguard the coast from extreme weather. All over the world, people are having to adapt to unpredictable climate and weather patterns. In Canada, where sea ice has become dangerously thin, a scheme is providing real-time measurements of ice thickness to local communities. This data reveals which routes are safe to travel and which are not. Meanwhile, in Los Angeles, where extreme drought has become the norm, 96 million shade balls have been put into the LA reservoir to help reduce evaporation rates. These projects show the level of innovation that communities are using to protect themselves against increasingly volatile weather. But the question remains, are these long-term solutions or are they just masking the real problem?